You have to really know your cues, really be able to pinpoint where everything is meant to be at the right time. The Hall of Prophecies is a good example. The entire thing is a digital set. Of course, on the shelves are millions of these glass orbs. When we looked at the designs, the first thing that sprung to me was, well, you can't build anything that big, and you'll only be able to build a partial amount, and then we'll have to extend it anyway. And everything's glass, so it's going to reflect anything, so we'll probably spend more time painting things out than putting things in. It just seemed like, really, this was the set that lent itself perfectly to using computer graphics. We basically shot um, all of the actors on green screen so that we could put the digital set in around them. I have to tell you, for the actors it's hard because green screen is not the easiest thing to key off if you're trying to find a performance. That was actually, I remember it being quite daunting. I think when we all stepped on, we were literally kind of, is this all we have? You almost can't imagine that because a room like that doesn't exist. So you need to find ways of stimulating all the actors and making them feel it's real. So I got my sound designer, James, to create a soundtrack which created an ambience and a kind of spooky feel. Never long bottom, is it? How's mum and dad? Better now they're about to be avenged. <laughs> and I, I'd play that to everybody before we'd shoot something sometimes. I'd say, listen guys, I just want you to close your eyes and this is what this environment sounds like. And we'd press the button and this strange, spooky sound would come on. Have you got that? Okay, we've all got that. Good, okay, hold that thought. Okay, turn over. Now, stupefy! After a day of shooting, I suddenly realised I was probably with the greatest green screen pros in the universe. When you say, I want you to imagine this whole shelf is collapsing, you know, most seasoned professional actors would struggle with that. But actually, you know, they've been doing green screen for like 10 years. In the underwater sequence, we had to create for that not only an underwater environment, but it had to be a magical underwater environment. We began first with the thought that we might do it what's called dry for wet, where you take an actor, you blow wind on them to give the sense of movement. The problem with that for us was that the hair would never move in, and undulate at the right speed it never really felt like you were going to believe that you were underwater. So it then became clear to us that we were going to have to shoot this underwater in some form or other. And we had to build a tank. We dug out the huge pit in D stage, which was designed by John and completely sort of fitted out under his supervision. We all thought he was a bit mad. Actually, it was far too big a hole. When we started, it was just enormous. I thought we were digging the whole studio up. It was but he was right. Actually, in the end, it was the perfect size. Three, two, one, go. The blue screen underwater tank was used essentially to um, allow us to key Dan off the background. We used backlit blue screen material in this instance where we basically created a three-walled tank with a viewing window at one side so that there were no lights in any of the shots and the screen itself was perfectly evenly lit from behind, which helps us massively in the actual keying and getting a, a decent mat and good edges. Again, it's all part of the technical side of then putting him into the other world. The sequence itself, you know, offered lots of different challenges. With so many different aspects of the sequence, it was weeks and weeks of shooting. Go for it, or rehearse one. Go for it. We had to train Dan Radcliffe to swim underwater and Dan had to perform while holding his breath effectively. Breather out. The bubble's clear and action. So he would perform for 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And looking down Dan. And air it, air it. And one of the divers would swim over with the oxygen, he'd breathe, and then he would do the next take. Very good, Dan. Well the main thing that really sort of was a bit frustrating was the fact that communication is obviously quite difficult. There are certain signals like this. This confused me, because this means, quick, I'm drowning, get me up to the surface. Whereas to me, that means, hey, I'm fine. It does take a while to get used to it. We built an underwater habitat so that the actors 
didn't have to come up to the surface in between takes. Right, just take a 15 minute break for the minute, drink some water. Okay, can we stay down here, yeah? Stay down there for a the minute. They had a loudspeaker and camera system to, to give them contact with the surface so they could talk to the director and get instructions for the next shot. And zap! So it was hugely challenging from a physical and practical standpoint. Dan, thank you very much for a good week. Let's Dan out the water, please. Print that one as well. Thank you very much, Dan. And then, with the aid of digital effects, we had to create the environment and create the creatures. It's virtually completely computer generated, apart from Harry himself. The scale of things had to be beyond what was real. There was very complicated rocks and cliffs. The water was filled with particulate floating around. Everything was covered in lots of different types of seaweed, all of which was moving in every single shot. We had to make it feel underwater. We had to make it feel murky and dank and deep. But at the same time, sometimes we needed to be able to see hundreds of meters into the distance to get some beautiful wide landscapes. At one stage, we changed the look of everything completely and started again from scratch because it looked fantastic at that stage, but it didn't look scary enough. So the whole sequence took about 18 months, right from the first imaginings of, of how, how to make it work to, to the final delivery of the last shot. So it was a lot of fabrication, a lot of imagination while shooting it. A real challenge, but an awful lot of fun. The running joke for, for us on, on Potter was that that castle changed every movie. It had to do one thing for one movie, and, or something was added for the next movie. So we've, we've done our best through all the movies to sort of not keep you in this one little space of the castle. You will have a space that is, that is surrounded by green. That space is the size of a football pitch. And the stuff that's put on afterwards is wrapped around you. When you see Harry walking through the Scottish hillside in the snow, it's one single shot with a lot of different layers, so it was very complex. We had to build the snow, we had to create all the environments and piece them together. Piece that miniature model with that blue screen element and blend it seamlessly so you actually believe that it exists. Ronald Weasley! How dare you steal that car! I am absolutely disgusted! For the Howler letter, we needed to come up with a design that would work for both the closed version and the Howling version, which would be animated by visual effects. If you put another two out of line, we'll bring you straight home! The closed version is fairly straightforward, standard letter, but within it are elements that we knew that we could use for the shouting version. The ribbon round it is there for a reason so that it can become a tongue that's, that's waggling as it's shouting. And the shape of the envelope lends itself to unfurling and becoming slightly mouth-like. And the letter inside, which does have the actual text of the scene of Mrs. Weasley shouting, becomes the teeth. The ministry letter, which is based on the whole howler concept, Dear Mr. Potter. It's a tricky thing as well to give it a great sort of performance. The seal on the front of it turns into a pair of lips and the little slit that goes down in the sides open up into a pair of eyes. You are hereby expelled from Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And the idea is trying to add life to something that inherently is such an everyday sort of object. Another good example was the Quick Quotes Quill in uh, the fourth film. We could have done the simple thing of it just sits there on the pad and it starts moving and all that, but we just sort of extended Rita Skeeter into the quill itself. Scratch that last. The length of the quill, it adds to the feelings of the flourishes. Every time the pen does a little twirl, it ripples. 
there's points when Rita is no, slightly no. flirtatious and it's slightly flirtatious too, and other times when it sits up and takes notice, and other times when it sneakily goes off and writes something down that it probably shouldn't have written down. And you can tell from the way it's been beautifully animated that it's got slightly sneaky intentions. It's a classic example of one of the things that makes the Harry Potter movies what they are, is this almost a throwaway little joke, a character. It's a side thing in the scene. But it's, you know, an extra level of humour and an extra level of interest. Just to give the movie the richness that it has. Hi there, here's today's daily fact. Draco Malfoy's candy and drink sneaking on the set of the Harry Potter films forced wardrobe to sew all the students' pockets shut. The robes had huge pockets, and once actor Tom Felton started taking chocolates and sweets, all the actors followed suit. Make sure to click below to subscribe or on the side for more great content.